hello. My name is uh, Todd Palmer, and I'm happy to speak at uh, the conference. And today I wanted to really uh, delve into some work uh, my group has been doing and looking at uh, the role of minor alloying element variations in additively manufactured materials. Now, as a, as a welding conference and uh, going into what additive manufacturing is, I think it's an important topic to think about, particularly in terms of how our knowledge of welding and rapid solidification and phase transformations under really different types of thermal histories are, are really impacting what we're seeing in additive manufacturing. I want to look at a few of the alloy, a few alloy systems where these minor alloy element variations that are not outside of compositions that we are allowed or specifications, but really within those specifications and how they can impact some of the microstructures that we're actually seeing. So would like to, to move on and just uh, for those of the recording, little information about me and acknowledgements uh, for work here done at Penn State. So I tried to include uh, the wide range of, of people who've been involved in really working in the area of additive manufacturing, particularly those of, of metallic systems. And a lot of them across are uh, collaborators, other professors, former students of mine uh, that we've worked, that I've worked with over time. And really some of the funding that we've received uh, in support of a lot of this work. And um, I would like to acknowledge American Welding Society upfront for uh, a lot of this work has been funded through the Graduate Research Fellowship Program that you'll see. And I'll, I'll make note of that as we, we go through the, the talk. Now, just as a quick look at what we're going to do is I want to talk a little bit first. Uh, a lot of you have heard a lot of my, my talks in, in welding and laser welding and electron beam welding. Uh, one area that, that I am working in that, that's related to the field, and it's not always something we, we really cover a lot in welding, is the role of powder feedstocks and how they really impact what we're seeing in terms of compositions. And what we're going to see is really that the role of oxygen and nitrogen and some of these interstitial alloying elements that as welders we're, we're really familiar with, but in the additive manufacturing field and really in rot type processes aren't really there. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about oxide inclusions in stainless steels. Now we're familiar with these, a lot of them are designed into it, but in a lot of cases, our starting oxygen levels are much, much higher than we would typically see in plate material. And so what they're doing is, is they're really changing sort of the evolution of these oxide inclusions. What we're going to see is they're potentially bad actors in them. And I want to finish up really talking about uh, some work we've done in, in really a common nickel-based alloy is Inconel 625 and really of how the, the changes in nitrogen composition can really impact some of the secondary phases that, that we've seen. And I think this is, is really some interesting work and something that that has some long-term uh, impact, can have long-term impact on how we view sort of this alloy and high temperature uh, nickel-based alloys. But really starting off with these chemistry variations that we see, and I always like to sort of start here a little bit with really the complexity of additive manufacturing and sort of where we, we really want to start in, and think about how it's impacting what we're, we're really looking at. And what we tend to see is we really start with really that material and chemistry compatibility. And, and here I just threw a, a, a small uh, thermocal, uh, just the use of computational thermodynamics. It's a powerful tool that we all really should be taking advantage of and in telling us how we can deal with what are really complex multi-component alloys. And really the alloys that we're most familiar with are really that when we really start breaking them down. And really the role of powder feedstocks and how those beam interactions and melt pool dynamics impact these. Now we, we tend to get caught up a lot in defects and, and not so much in post-processing and how they can relieve those and impact really the microstructures and properties that we have. But overall, starting at this point is we have a complex process where we're taking a powder feedstock with a composition that was designed for rot processing melting it with a laser and really hoping that it has the properties that we would expect out of the raw materials. And, and for most of us to know is they really don't. But starting off with that composition, 
and that powder processing. And so the powder processing itself really relies on, on different types of atomization processes. And we tend to see this in the additive field where there's talk. We're seeing some role of plasma atomization coming in where we're basically, in this case, we can say we take a titanium spool. Think of most of the plasma atomization processes out there really as a gas metal arc a torch or maybe a plasma torch where we're melting wire and we're really producing uh, spherical particles out of that. Now, the vast majority of the tonnage that we're looking at in additive manufacturing processes really comes out of this really gas atomization process where we tend to see generally spherical particles. Now, where the, the differences come in and where we've been sort of looking now, what we have here is, is maybe a little bit of a busy plot, but I had to have one of my students explain to me what, what these plots actually are and, and what they're really look at are violin plots. Now, this is just looking at Inconel 625 and to, to let you know how unpleasant I can be really as an advisor and, and really to direct sort of the research. I asked the student to go in the literature and find everything he could find, all the reported compositions for Inconel 625 and plot them in a way that we could see how they're varying. In, in really in the literature and what how that can be impacting the resulting microstructure. So in 625, what we tend to see are a couple of things that, that st stood out to us is the wide variability, but really that iron content that's allowed to vary, how much titanium can vary. And what we're gonna, we've found is that these titanium and silicon variations have a significant impact upon what's going on in other alloy systems. Now, the other thing that, that struck us that we hadn't really thought about initially was how much oxygen and nitrogen are allowed to vary or whether they're not controlled. Part of it is they're not controlled because they're not specified. And so it's, it tends to be a little bit, you'll notice that we have a lot more data points in some of these other plots than we do in the oxygen and nitrogen. It's because of the scarcity of data that we have in terms of people in the literature actually reporting that. Now there's a wealth of this data in here you look at and we can really start to understand just by going back in the literature and maybe compiling that data a little more of how much these alloying elements are varying on us. Now, even in something as common as 316L stainless steel. Now I, I tend to go to some other of the additive processes and when I, I do speak with a lot of my students about some of their work is really reaching back and thinking about what 316L stainless steel is. We tend to think of stainless steels really is like iron, chrome, and nickel. And 316, we add a little molybdenum to it. And we tend to forget that it's actually a fairly complex multi-component system. I didn't even add iron here, but as we go across here, we have a lot of different components. And one of the things we see in these plots is that we're generally pretty good at reporting between these, but when we just give a maximum, we can vary rather significantly. And, and manganese is one that, that does trouble me a little bit, as you can see, and we're gonna see the impact of this variation in, in manganese is the really of, you put a maximum of 2% on manganese, it really starts to, go to a point where it can vary rather significantly you know really within even this range it's one weight percent variation now copper is the one that is a concern as far as scrap stream and, and scrap stream and sustainability are going to become really big issues here now when we think about it from a welding standpoint we start to go look right at nickel and chrome equivalents and i will say uh you know for this audience and, and for a lot of uh welders the, the idea of chrome and nickel equivalents is highly misused in the additive manufacturing field. It's, it's largely misunderstood. But what we see here is even with these changes in compositions, even within allowable limits, we can really drastically change what the solidification mode could be. And that's even within. So the predictability of the microstructure that we're seeing especially when we're melting things with lasers and, and expecting them and putting them through all of these different thermal histories are going to be impacted by that. So one of the first things we started looking at were duplex stainless steels, not always a common alloy in 
the U.S., but one that, that has a, a number of wide uses. And this is work that, that came out of uh, a dissertation by one of my uh, now former students who's now at the National Institute of Standards and Technology is Andrew Imes. And he, had, he did a lot of this work on an American Welding Society graduate research fellowship. So what we started looking at, and we were interested primarily in how do we additively manufacture duplex stainless steels? And what that really led us to was looking at and getting us the ability to look at lean standard and, and super grade. So we wanted to see the variation across there. Our initial concerns with undertaking the project were a little more on the fact is how do we avoid or get rid of sigma phase with the heating that goes on. And we wanted to look at directed energy deposition in particular for it and really try to understand how ferrite and austenite levels changed. Well, we did that and we had some pretty good success in looking at that, but what we started noticing early on was that we had a lot of like really small sort of inclusions through there. And so we wanted to start looking at what the powders look like. Now, most of the time when you, you go to a powder conference and, and you talk to people about, hey, I have a lot of oxygen in the powders, first thing that comes up is you're not handling the powders properly. You have a problem. You need to handle your powders better. You don't know what you're doing. You know, this, that's all there is to it. So we, we didn't really believe that was the case. Now, when we started looking at the powders, what you'll notice is we saw a lot of EDS maps tell us a lot is these small satellites don't always correspond to where we saw increases in oxygen, silicon, and manganese. But as we looked inside, we started seeing, so this is a cross section of an individual powder particle. We saw evidence that even within that cross section, we had it. So it's not so much a handling issue at this point is there's oxygen internally to it. And we even went to the point of looking inside a pore inside a powder particle and found oxide inclusions there as well. So it got us really thinking, so what are these inclusions? They're rather small. They're on the really the nanometer, you know, mics, micron, submicron level. We, we have some variations in, in some of our um, scales here, but we, we knew we had something going on. So we, we went back to computational thermodynamics and started really looking at it. Now, when we measured the amount of powder feedstock, what we saw is that we had about an order of magnitude more oxygen than we did in a rot material that we were comparing it to. And what that did, especially particularly for this grade, which was a uh, super duplex grade, is it promoted the formation of spinel within the liquid. So the amount of those oxide inclusions that we were seeing could not be removed through really other processes other than starting to melt the, the particles. So we, went and looked at how you varied it. And what we saw was the spinel really went after a certain point, we started wanting to form spinel within the liquid. And this, this spinel is really a chrome manganese oxide. And so um, outside of probably for a lot of us, what we would have learned in our, our steel processing classes, we haven't really thought of a spinel phase all that much. So we, uh, went and started looking. And so we went into the TEM, started saying, okay, what are the powder, what are the particles in the powder feedstock look like? And so we found our little bits of manganese sulfide, which are you know, to be expected. But the one thing that we probably didn't expect right off was that the oxide inclusions were amorphous, which they had no crystal structure. They had the compositions that we would expect. They had some manganese, some silicon, some oxygen. But in the powder phase, they were actually in this amorphous state. And that led us to think, well, it's the, the cooling rates within the gas atomization process hindered the formation of that. So we wanted to look a little more closely. So looking at as deposited materials, what really sort of drove us into a lot of this was we had seen these inclusions uh, present throughout. We'd seen these black sort of dots everywhere and they seemed to be like sort of acting almost like heterogeneous nucleation sites for austenite. And we talked about that in a, in a previous paper, but we hadn't really characterized the inclusions and how they're relating to it. And so we see how they're this inner granular and we, we get some nice metallography. Um, you know, Andrew did a, did a great job on the metallography, gave us a lot of really nice pictures to look at. 
But in the as deposited condition, we started seeing some differences. We saw a range of different structures. We saw some of the spinel that we, we expected. We also saw some rhodonite, which is basically a metastable version of the oxide it's coming out and it's a little less uh, uh, basically it's a little depleted in in manganese compared to the spinel but we also saw some of these amorphous characteristics to the the oxide inclusions as well and so we're just showing one but we looked at a, a range of inclusions that led us to the point of saying okay so we can basically predict this rhodonite phase especially at the oxide levels that we're talking about, uh, basically by playing some games with, with computational thermodynamics within the thermocalc of suppressing the spinel and what the next phase to come out would be in the next phase was rhodonite. So the computational thermodynamics was supporting what we were seeing in, in the TEM, which, which gave us a uh, you know, good feeling as far as that. Now, as we move into sort of other ways, so in the additive manufacturing arena, Post-processing is going to be key. It's, it's one of my real pet peeves and what I, I push people on is how we post-process the materials is going to, to really dictate what the final properties are. Hot isostatic pressing, uh, primarily to remove uh, processing-related defects, whether from lack of fusion or, or some other mechanisms, is one way to do it. Now, the high temperatures at which hot isostatic pressing is performed are also going to evolve these oxide inclusions and give us something that is a little closer to what we would expect. And what we found was that the spinel phase came out in this. So we had this wide range of evolution of, of oxide inclusions in, in these materials. And that gave us sort of a, an idea really thinking about it. So we've looked at some other ones is there's other work out there where some are trying to look at the oxide inclusions and how they're strengthening and how they're impacting the mechanical properties. Now, mechanical property-wise at, at room temperature, we could not really have been too much happier with what we found. We did see some issues along transverse orientations that gave us a little lower engineering or strain or strain to fa uh, the strain to failure that we would see. That can be attributed to lack of fusion defects, but we saw those went away when we hot isostatically pressed them. In you know, case upon case, we outperformed uh, rot materials across the board, whether for standard and, and duplex grades. And elongations were great. So testing at room temperature sort of really got us thinking that, hey, we're really on to something. But for a lot of these duplex grades, the impact energy is the main driver. And if you look at the table, it's a little small, I understand. But looking at the table, what we tended to see is there was a major fall off in the performance of these materials under low temperatures and under high strain rates. So all these impact energies were measured at about negative 50 degrees Celsius and, and right around in that range. Now, in the static tensile testing, we had dominant uh, ductile failure. We don't see these impacts, but under the, basically these low temperatures about negative 45 degrees C, what we start to see is that we really see a degradation in, in these impact energies. And that can be really attributed to a couple of things is the ductile to brittle transition with the, the BCC and the FCC phases, but the oxide inclusions also really tended to drive that. So they became really a bad actor at these, these lower temperatures. And as we started looking at it, we can see these oxide inclusions and how they're really impacting the microstructures and the brittle failure modes. And in some cases along the brittle failure pathways, we start to see cracks. And within those cracks, we see that the oxide inclusions tended to initiate them. So there's, there's an interplay that we have here, but oxide inclusions in this case, don't really help us out. Now, that's with uh, duplex stainless steels. And so we wanted to look at some other stainless steels and, and how they're impacting. Now, what we saw is, are we gonna see the same types of inclusions when we go to austenitic stainless steels? And so we started looking at a couple different ones. So we were able to, to get some differences in, in composition. And we did that uh, with, 
looking at some nitrogen versus some argon atomized. And so in the gas atomization processes, the atomization gas is basically changed. Now there's some other uh, routes that you really go to that have a bigger determination on the nitrogen composition, but we really were after this, this change in the oxygen composition that you, you tend to see here is from the nitrogen atomized 0.06 to a 0.01 with the argon atomized. So that change in the nitrogen composition and we tend to see some of our other uh, elements are changing where the chromium and the nickel are changing, but you know differences that we have in our uh, chrome and nickel equivalents tend to come out here as well. Now, what we tend to see is there weren't that many differences. We saw a slight change in, in basically what our predicted solidification mode would be uh, going from austenite to ferrite in the from the nitrogen to the argon atomized, but those spinel phases still ended up there. Now we look around and we, we start seeing some, some similarities, not very much differences in the microstructures, the cellular microstructures that we see. A lot of what really are those features that, that people wanna look at. Now, what we did start to see is these oxide inclusions showed up again, but they showed up in, in a little different features. And they went from really sort of micron size to almost nano size. We tend to see this, this bimodal distribution of them. And what we saw as well was a change in their compositions as we had, as we went to nitrogen atomized where you had you know, 2.6 microns and sort of to 100 nanometers and in that range and the argon atomized you know very much the same same type of thing but you start seeing the presence of aluminum in the aluminum in the larger ones with some silicon indicating that there might be a different feature to it but when we started looking again is this idea when we started looking at these nano sized inclusions in an as built condition they were once again amorphous and and we did see that we we see have that from our our uh, Pest Fourier transform of our nano diffraction patterns that you, you tend to get in these TEM modes. And in the nitrogen atomized powders, we see you know, much the, the same thing. In the argon atomized, they, they're both amorphous. But when we start changing the composition, we can see some differences. Now, these were just in the as deposited condition. When we hot isostatically pressed them, they went back into that spinel that we would expect. But on these, in this first alloy set we look at, we want to go back and look at the manganese levels. And we see it's, it's a little more at that traditional area, that above that 1%. It's just going back to those differences that we, we tended to see. Now, if we move into an alloy with a low amount of manganese, and we were able to test this, and so we have significant, really, fatigue data on on this alloy, and this this was this was another alloy system where we wanted to look at it. Now, what we see here is that when we strip the alloy of manganese, the oxide inclusions tend to change as well, and what they tend to become is more of a tritomite, which is really a silica-rich inclusion that we have. So, and they're also, you know, in this case, they they are. This was after hot isostatic pressing. So they started out as, as amorphous, worked their way into really this tritomite, which became stable at that point. So a change in just manganese can, can lead us into something different. Now, what became unique here was these are some fracture surfaces from fatigue data that we've obtained. And there are a couple uh, other things to take a look at here. And as far as the oxide inclusions, and one of the, the big features on here is as we go to chromium and silica, we see some differences in segregation. But what I want to really draw attention to are some of these features on the fracture surface. And remember, this is a 316 L stainless steel. And so what we see are these tire tracks, which indicate to us and what we can attribute it to is really an oxide inclusion sort of working its way across there during fatigue. And so there's little to no strengthening going on with the oxide inclusions under fatigue conditions in these 316L stainlesses, which to us is, is was, we were a bit surprised to find these and, and the role that these oxide inclusions play, which from, from our work is apparently rather minimal, but 
that the differences are really coming out with changes in in uh, microstructure or in composition, I should say. Now, precipitation hardened stainless steels. So we see as we're going through these different um, elements that we looked at. Now, we were really initially interested in pH grade stainlesses, much like everybody else being fascinated with this idea of retained austenite and how properties can change. Now, what we tended to find here were, were is we changed our nitrogen composition. We called them argon atomized and nitrogen atomized. It's really more a question of one with high nitrogen levels, one with low nitrogen levels. And so what we tended to see was we, we see very significant differences in our solidification mode, but we also see where this oxide inclusion tends to show up. And once we started looking a little more closely, we saw oxide inclusions in these alloys as well. Now they're, they've been, been observed elsewhere and there's a, a bit of uh, thought going to how they're impacting strength. I would posit to say initially that the strength is not really in, in from what we're seeing is not being terribly influenced by these. They, they exist there, but as we start looking at them, they're all silica rich. And, and that was for us a little different. Now, what we are seeing is, is they are serving as nucleation sites for uh, carbon nitrides that can form under the different conditions. And so things of interest to us is, is well there. But the point is, is that the oxide inclusions are changing as we work our way through. Now, I wanna change directions here. And this gives us a little bit of an idea and really end on this is what happens when you start changing it in an Inconel 625? Now, our, our work initially started out with taking a look at 625 and really looking at what the role of iron was. Now, what we tended to find was that there wasn't that much of a difference as we looked at it. We saw these secondary phases and we really sort of worked our way into taking a look at them and getting an idea that, hey, when we change the iron content, we started seeing some real differences, first off, in basically the presence of titanium. And it wasn't that much of a difference in titanium. It's the difference between about 0.03 and 0.3 weight percent titanium in the low iron and the high iron. But what we tended to see beyond some of these inclusions that we had here was the segregation of these alloying elements. Uh, we, we expected the niobium and the moly, the molybdenum to be there, but the formation of this titanium in the high iron content tended to be a lot different than we expected. And so we saw these different phases form and we start looking at the titanium nitrides or these titaniums that form, we had something that was different there. So we wanted to sort of take a look. Now the grain structures, completely different. And what that led to was a significant difference in the yield strength of what we were looking at and really got us thinking. And so to be honest, the yield strength difference is about 25% in the as deposited case with the low iron, as you would expect having the higher yield strength. So that led us into what's going on with these inclusions that we saw in this segregation. So we went into high energy X-ray diffraction. And what that allowed us to do was start really indexing some different phases. And we started seeing things we didn't begin to expect. Presence of basically Z phases in 625 merely being led to, and we see even in the high nitrogen, we didn't see anything. We saw really MN phases form, which led us to where is the MN phase coming from and why are we seeing a Z phase, which is basically a carbonitride. What we found was that once we measured the nitrogen composition, we found that it was really high. It was in the 0.1 to 0.14 range. And that led us to go back to computational thermodynamics and work our way to see how different it is when you consider nitrogen in and Inconel 625 and how it was impacting really these different phases. And what we saw were different phases coming out. And we were able to use uh, transmission electron microscopy to start identifying them in low iron and in high iron cases where they varied much more. And even with the hot ice, presence of hot isostatic pressing, we saw that these phases tended to exist across the board. And that was something that was, was really pleasant for us to see. It was a little surprising, but I think really a helpful finding because the presence of the Z phase from the as deposited to the hip condition indicates that 
it is there. Now, the other thing to remember about this is the Z phase is rich in niobium. And as far as high temperature usage of 625, there's a potential for this phase to preclude the formation of delta phase. And so we are currently writing up some results on that that I'm not presenting here, but just as a, a preview for some of our coming attractions in that area. And we tended to see the same thing in the high iron phases. So uh, there are, is a potential with some of these of really looking at it. So we can see the, the evolution of the microstructures, but sort of where I wanna end up here, and I think I'm just uh, maybe a couple minutes over, is we, we tend to see these high increases in oxygen content between, in powder feedstocks and in AM materials. And what they're driving is the presence of some of these oxide rich phases or oxide inclusions that we can call them. And they tend to evolve as we post-process them and go from different conditions. Now, high nitrogen levels, on the other hand, and some of these other alloys and how they interact with these other multi-component systems that we have are ones that we want to take into account and start looking a little more closely at as we evolve our uh, understanding of AM and how compositions can impact microstructural evolution. So uh, thanks for your time. And that's what I have for today. <laughs>